time did you speak to anybody about it? Did you ever have a conversation? So it got to the point um, that my period stopped, all of my hair fell out pretty much, and I knew that something really bad was happening. So I took myself to my GP um, and asked for help. However, like the help that they arranged is, is better in Scotland, I'm just saying. But the help that was arranged for me um, was very, very sporadic. And right. actually my appointment wasn't going to be for six months. So I ended up seeing a private counsellor and got myself better six months. that way. Yeah. Uh huh. That is... And I was also told at one point, oh, just keep a chocolate bar in your handbag. <laughs> and then, as, as the advice from a, from a doctor of this person who was eating, you know, at, at that point, probably 800 calories a day. Um, so that was quite eye-opening. And it's also something that I remember now when I see patients and yeah. kind of how to speak to people. Yeah, well, that's good, definitely, because you've been on both sides of it. But yeah. That is like... <laughs> <laughs> the cure all solution in that secret Mars bar. I wonder if like the person who's in the tea ever sees this is like um, <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> Dang. <laughs> um I feel like I'm like lost for words now. <laughs> insane. So you saw a counsellor. Yeah, so I saw a counsellor and got proper help and I also joined a support group with girls no. was, that were suffering from the same problems. Um, I feel like that's quite a big jump. Like how did you get from that point to there? Like was were you kind of like would you say you were like declining, like getting Yeah, and I think I'd been thinking that I needed help for a long, long time. Yeah. And I'd just always been too scared to ask. And it got to the point actually that my housemates wrote a letter to my mum um without me knowing and said that we can't we can't deal with how she is just now, we're so worried about her, there's not enough support, we feel lost because they've really been trying to help me. Um, and our, So what had they said to you like previously to that? So just how worried they were, like we'd all eat together and they'd seen that I wasn't eating a lot or I'd take my food to my room so I didn't have to eat it, um, or they'd hide my running shoes, things like that. Wow. Yeah, so they, they really were amazing girls, um, but when somebody is unwell, you, you need to professional help. Yeah. And that's sort of what I think, if it hadn't been for them doing that, I probably would have got better. Yeah. After your parents came back to Newcastle, after the letter, yeah. what, was the, what was the next thing after that? Was that when you went to the doctors? Like, was that? So I'd already been to the doctors and they weren't very helpful. So I'd kind oh, okay. of, yeah, so that was before. So you'd made a move. So I had made a move and I kind of knew that I could need things to change. Yeah. And at that point, that's when I got involved with the recovery group and a lovely girl called Amy who, um, she kind of worked, she volunteered at the group and she also worked for BEAT, Beating Disorders Charity. Right, yeah. Um, and she used to come over like once a week and we'd like cook together and she'd kind of text me most days, check in with me. I'd write down what I was going to do, like my plan and she'd check it. And she was just amazing because she'd been very anorexic and was kind of my idea of like just such a healthy happy beautiful girl that she really really carried me through recovery and I think having someone that you do look up to who's been through similar things really does help mm -hmm. because you can see that you know you can put weight on and still look amazing and obviously look a lot lot better um, and it's not scary. It's not as scary as you think. And just the mental, having mental energy back and not being cold all the time, being able to <laughs> go out and socialize and have boyfriends, it just felt amazing. And I think once that started happening, I just didn't really look back. Right. So when you were first in recovery, what were your kind of like thoughts towards the future? Like, what did you think? So I didn't. There were days. It kind of varied. There was good days and bad days. There were days that I felt really proud that I'd, you know, eaten all my food and challenged myself. And there were other days that it just felt impossible, and that I would never, because I was getting weighed at that point as well, um, weekly. 
and like weeks when I hadn't put weight on and my weight was the same, I'd lost weight, I just felt like I was totally failing. So I think as time went on, because weight gain in recovery as well isn't like a straight line, mm -hmm. it kind of goes up and down and that can be quite freaky when you're, when you like controlling things, mm -hmm. which I do. You want it to be perfect every week and I remember the, the doctor saying you shouldn't be putting on more than half a kilo a week. If you're doing that then you're overshooting and it could be really dangerous and That's so really like, yeah. yeah which yes it can be but it's within a range and I was having blood tests taken and things as well to make sure that didn't happen and that made me almost think like I can't put on more this week mm -hmm. because something bad might happen which wasn't true. Um, so another point, if you are if you're either friends with or you're helping someone with eating disorder, be very careful how you word things mm -hmm. and what you say and what actions that might make them take. Because often people who do suffer from eating disorders do like controlling things. Mm -hmm. So if you almost say that we want to see weight gain every week and don't put a number on everything, it takes some of the pressure off because there's no perfect recovery there's no perfect way to do it and there's no perfect plan it really is just getting comfortable in your own skin again so now like yeah. what would you say looking back how have you changed like your body image now versus then so after i recovered i really liked my body i didn't at first because as I said, weight gain isn't linear and also what tends to happen is it all goes on your abdomen mm -hmm. when you kind of gain weight quite quickly. But once that has settled, I was probably the happiest I'd been with my body. Um, How weight were you then? I think I was, I was probably about 50 kilos, 51 kilos, something like that. Um, and I started weight training at that point too because I was told that was good for my bone density mm -hmm. and I just started loving feeling strong. Yeah. I thought like really empowered. Um it's so, that's a real problem bone density, isn't it? With, yeah. with restriction. Yeah, and I had a bone scan done when I was anorexic and I had osteopenia. Right. So I had the bones of a sixty five year old lady. Wow. Yeah. Which again was a bit of a wake up call. That is scary. And I was twenty one at the time. Um, when you decided to go ahead with competing, did you worry? Like, were you like, is this a bad idea? Am I just setting myself up for something? So here? I didn't really know what it involved when right. I started competing to the extent um, that I do now. And so no, I didn't, but my parents did. Right, okay. So when I told them that I was going to control my diet and this and that and the other, they kind of obviously that flashed up some morning lights for them. Yeah. But once they saw that I was doing it with a coach in a healthy way, I think they were okay with it. But yeah, it was a bit of a test at yeah, first. Definitely. So did you, do you feel like it ever has affected you or did you worry about relapsing? I did worry about relapsing and it's something that I'm quite mindful of. Um, but as it is, I prefer my body I mean, I'm not that long post-show um, and I prefer my body about five kilos heavier than it is just now, um, which going kind of back into my well days, I would have never said, Yeah. you know. Um, and I also know, I've got, I think most people have a set point they feel the best at yeah, definitely. and I'm definitely aware of that now, which weight you feel good at as well as look good. Yeah. Um, because being underweight, doesn't just make you look a certain way, it makes you feel and function not optimally. Yeah. For sure. One thing I would say is I think it's becoming quite common for a lot of girls almost to go into competition prep as a means to lose weight because yes. they aren't happy with the body in its current state. This is so true. They think that getting like a competition prep coach and saying I'm gonna do a 
16 week cut or 16 week prep, whatever, is going to solve all of their problems. Yeah. But coming out the other end of a prep like that, unless you're a very experienced competitor, so much harder. Yeah, it's and those problems aren't going to go away. If you're not happy with how you look, that will not change, you know, plus or minus 10 kilos. Those feelings will always be there with you. So, yeah, and also after such an intense cut, like, the chances of putting that back on again in the first fortnight is very, very high. Yeah, uh-huh. And it can also trigger a really negative relationship with food. Um, and a huge amount of competitors binge eat after shows. Yeah. Um, and really, I think it's the responsibility of coaches as well to really go into how they feel about themselves at the moment and be aware of any warning signs of potential eating disorders before mm -hmm. agreeing to prep somebody for a show. And um, also to not be afraid to ask professionals for help uh, or tell tell the person that you're coaching that you think you can't help them and that they need to get help. Yeah. And knowing when you can help and when you can't, I think it's really important. Yeah, like as a coach, if you cannot take on that role yourself. The role of a, a counsellor or a psychiatrist, like it's not it's not okay to yeah. try and do that. Yeah. Because ultimately I I have experience in this field, but I'm not equipped to deal yeah. with that on, on exactly. that level. Exactly, like having a baby doesn't mean you should deliver one. Exactly. And passing your driving test doesn't mean you should teach someone to drive. Like, yes, this is very true. Having an eating disorder doesn't make you an expert. Yeah. It means you've got insight, but it doesn't mean you know how to fix somebody. What advice would you give to girls who are kind of in your position, say, going to uni? Yeah. So, I think if you do feel that you've struggled with anything that we've spoken about today, I think what you need to focus on is where do I want to be in a year's time? Do I want to be in the same situation? Or do I want something better for myself? Do I want to be free of the voice in my head, if there is one? How am I going to do that? And who can I talk to? So your GP is your first port of call, really, and hopefully will be more helpful than mine was. And if you do have good friends that you can talk to, that's really, really useful. I know a lot of girls isolate themselves, so don't feel quite as um, supported. I was lucky in that sense. Another thing I found really helpful was the Beat website has an awful lot of forums and information. I didn't even know this. Yeah, they're, they're great and they also have people that can befriend you, phone you, email you, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Um, so that's really useful. I think having somebody else when you're going through recovery is great because your brain is not functioning as it should be mm -hmm. and you need an outside point of view from somebody who can help and does have the right training um, because working with people with eating disorders they, they are very manipulative, they tend to be and it's quite easy to believe somebody is doing everything that they say they're doing when actually they're still very unwell mm -hmm. so that's that's a few bits of advice and also remember that you're not alone and the recovery is possible and it doesn't matter if you recover slower than somebody or faster and at, there's no perfect recovery and everybody's still going to have hard days even when they consider themselves like we both consider ourselves recovered but there are still days that are more difficult and that you feel that you don't always like the way you look and actually that's okay it's, it's all right to feel like that sometimes. Yeah, that's definitely one of the harder things to accept is that like you can't just be 100% forever and then. Like it's not just like yeah. you make you make a turning point one day. It's, it's it was never going to be that way. Yeah, unfortunately. But nothing in life is, and accepting that in itself is a huge step. Yeah, and also if if we can recover from it, then you guys can too. There is hope. There's always hope. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys, we're going to wrap it up there. But thank you for watching. And don't forget to check out the other parts of this on my channel. We'll leave a link below. Um, leave your comments in the description. And we will see you in the next one. Thanks. Bye. Bye.